everybody, and welcome to the webinar. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us today. My name is Clay Malcolm, and I'm uh, delighted to be joined by Troy Eckerd today, who's going to share his experience in the oil and gas investment world. So we're going to talk a little bit about IRAs first and how they can invest in alternative assets, and then I'll turn it over to Troy for his uh, his screen and, and his slides so that we can learn a little bit more about how perhaps the two can be combined, IRA investing and oil and gas investments. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions that you have, and if you would do that by typing them into the question box, that would be great, and we will answer them at the end. So that could be for uh, Troy about oil and gas, or me about IRAs, or anything that's on your mind, we'll do our best to field those at the end of the presentation. And uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? If you if you are not seeing my webcam, then this is a picture of me. I'm not only in the self-directed IRA uh, industry, but I'm a self-directed IRA investor alongside you. So I'm actually really excited to get the information today and learn a little bit more uh, about things that I didn't necessarily know. If you do want to talk uh, self-directed IRA investing, there's my contact information. So please feel free to contact me. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, at Advanced IRA, we do not give tax, legal, or investment advice. All of the information in the presentation today is for educational purposes only. We don't uh, advocate any particular investment strategy or investment vendor, and we certainly encourage you to talk to your financial team about any investment that your IRA uh, might be uh, thinking about making. Our role in the equation at Advanced IRA is really to make sure that the account type that you have gets to keep the tax advantages that are related to that account type by doing the bookkeeping and administration of the account. So that's really our role. And we specialize in making that a very you know, personal and easy experience for you by making sure that we have long-term employees that have a lot of experience. Every account holder gets their own account manager. So you have a one-stop shop in terms of calling if there's any problem with your account or you just have any questions, go ahead and call your account manager and you can start the solution right there and then. Uh, all of your uninvested cash at Advanced IRA is FDIC insured. And as you can see, this, this model of having person-to-person -person service and expertise right at the end of the phone there has really paid off. It's, we have over $1.3 billion in assets that are under our management, and uh, our, the account holders are giving us great feedback about their experience, and that's really what we're, we're going for. Now, a lot of people haven't really necessarily heard about self-directed IRAs, and if they have, they, they may not know a whole lot about them. And if that's your case, please don't feel like you're behind. Uh, IRAs, since the 1970s when they started, have always been able to invest in alternative assets. It's just that a lot of IRA custodians don't handle alternatives, and so you don't hear a lot about them. But the process and the rules that are associated with your IRA investing in alternatives has been around since the very beginning. All it really is is finding a custodian that knows how to do the, the bookkeeping and the administration for those account types uh, to make sure that your account is in good standing. So again, if you're thinking about self-directed IRAs but you hadn't heard about them until recently, you're not behind. This is this is really what we're here for is to kind of uh, talk about how that uh, process works and how it can work for you. So the account types are actually the same as you're already familiar with. Self-directed, that term does not mean a different account type or a legal distinction. It's the account types that you already know. So you may have a traditional or a Roth, a health savings account, it could be an employer account like a 401k or a SEP IRA. All these account types can invest in alternative assets. And they keep the same contribution rules, distribution rules, uh, and tax advantages, most importantly. Because one of the things that we're talking about today is matching the tax advantages for the account type with an investment that is going to produce returns that are good for your overall uh, account growth and also pay off at the right time for you. So there's a lot of strategy involved in choosing the asset type and matching it to your needs because your financial world is a is an individual thing and, and these accounts are usually only part of your financial world we understand that so the idea is to give you information so that you can match the, the advantages of the account type with the investment type and speaking of assets the irs allows for all kinds of assets that you may or may not be familiar with at least in terms of being in your ira so real estate private equity private lending 
today we're going to get to focus on oil and gas and how that's structured. Um, but there are all kinds of um, asset classes that are available for your IRA to invest in. And again, you get to keep the tax advantages. One of the things I think that's sometimes confusing from a vocabulary standpoint for investors is somebody will say, well, oh, Clay, I want to have my IRA invest in real estate. Well, that's an awfully broad statement, right? So real estate could comprise, oh, your IRA is going to buy a single family rental, or it might be investing in a, uh, a fund that then goes out and buys real estate or uh, does real estate notes or things like that. And one of the things I'm really interested today is to talk about when, when an IRA holder says to me, hey, I'd like to be involved in oil and gas, what does that look like? What is the actual asset type? How does it pay off? And that kind of thing. So the again, learning the vocabulary and understanding the investment and how it's going to work for you is really the key here. And one of the nice things I think also about self-directed IRA investing is the account holder really drives the process. So they are the motive force behind choosing the investment, choosing the, the asset provider that they want to work with, and using their financial team. So don't feel like you have to, even though it is a self-directed IRA and you as the account holder are the motive force, it doesn't necessarily mean that you, you have to do that all by yourself, right? So you get to bring your asset team, um, whether that's an oil and gas team or real estate or uh, certainly your other financial advisors, so your CPA, CFP, attorneys, things like that. So when you're choosing your investment, it's a great time to engage your whole team and choose what's best for you. And the process is really pretty easy. So if the, if the idea of investing in an alternative is a little bit of a, a new idea for you and you think it might be difficult, it actually really isn't. So it's basically three steps. You open an account at a self-directed IRA provider like Advanta that handles alternative assets. You fund that account with transfer, rollover, or contribution, or some combination of those things. So then you have an account that has money in it and it's ready to invest. So you would go about selecting the investment and your account manager will help you with the investment process, getting the investment documentation uh, in order so that we uh, can, can document the, uh, the investment and it will have the tax advantages of the account type. And once that happens, then that uh, investment just operates within the IRA. So any of the dividends or returns or money that comes in just comes right back into the IRA cash position and therefore, again, is still in the IRA. Even though you've dispersed money for an investment and received returns, it's all still encapsulated in the account. Now, I hope that that, that brief uh, description of how this works will help you to at least have your mind open to what Troy's gonna talk about in terms of the oil and gas uh, as a possible investment type. And I'll remind you that any questions that you have, if I glossed over something that you're interested in or you need detail on, please feel free to type those into the question box. And I'm happy to go ahead and answer those questions as uh, at the end of the presentation. And you know, if we don't even, if the presentation goes long and we don't get to them all, we'll certainly answer them via email after the fact. We wanna make sure that you get the information that you want. Now, all that being said, it's time for our, uh, guest expert, Troy Eckerd from Eckerd Land and Acquisitions. And Troy's gonna be able to uh, run through his presentation and will also answer questions at the end and share his expertise in the oil and gas field. So Troy, are you there and ready to go? I am, can you see my screen so I know I've got everything clear? I see it. Perfect, good morning everyone. I really appreciate Clay and Advanta for inviting us to uh, bring on an educational presentation about what uh, the oil and gas mineral rights sector looks like today and i can tell you that with the uh, amount of publicity given to the oil and gas industry the last 60 days and the uh, all-out media attention to the crude oil market globally i would imagine each one of you attending today may have a real vested interest in finding out how it's going to affect your overall portfolio um, a couple things i should tell you is that i started my career in 1985 in the oil and gas industry i'm 55 years old but i've been doing this for 35 years Virtually 100% of my career has been focused on U.S. energy, and I've been involved in everything you can think of from drilling, exploration, seismic programs, saltwater disposal wells. Uh, I'm currently an owner and on the board of the second largest natural gas pipeline in the Gulf of Mexico. So I've got a very deep, very broad background in U.S. energy, and uh, you'll find out over time that I'm very opinionated as to what I think is going to happen in the market. I'm very bold about what I believe 
will take place. Um, we are very, very honored to be uh, associated in, in helping educate investors about how they may or may not use their IRA proceeds in order to put them in a self-directed IRA. Uh, organizations like Advanta have done a phenomenal job helping investors to become informed and to learn how to better manage their assets. So today's presentation should be a way to introduce another type of investment product that might or might not be suitable for you with your uh, self-directed IRA. Um, I started my own self-directed IRA back in the 1990s. I, I, I'm aging myself, even though 55 is not old. I feel like I'm in an 80 year old body. I went into a quarantine with a full set of hair and no wrinkles and it's been nine weeks. Now I've got a man bun and, and wrinkles all over my face. This uh, shelter in place has been difficult on me. But I would like to start the presentation and then open it up for questions as uh, Clay guides the, uh, the hosting element of our presentation. So first off, you know, what we want to talk about is how and probably if you as an investor should look at uh, oil and gas mineral rights as something you might want to put into your IRA. I'm going to give you the pros and cons and tell you how it works. Here we go. So owning real property, which a mineral right is in fact a real property without real property liabilities. And I'll have a, a chart here in a few minutes on another slide that'll tell you exactly what I mean. But what you need to understand is that every single piece of property in the United States, every surface right, whether it's an apartment building, a farm, a pasture, a, a piece of residential property, every single acre of land in the United States also has an associated mineral right sitting below it. Now, it may not have any gold or copper or oil and gas, but you collectively as the surface owner, in most cases will own not only the surface rights, but the mineral rights below you. And in most cases, you own the air rights above you when it comes to cellular towers, windmills, or other types of use of airspace. All this has evolved over the last hundred years. But in the case of mineral rights, our specific uh, topic today, it comes with real property assignment. I Meaning you get a legal documented recorded deed in the courthouse for any mineral right. And that mineral right can be in fact totally separate from the surface rights, it can be severed. So today's presentation will specifically talk about mineral rights that are severed or separate and apart from the surface rights and what that looks like for possibilities for you as an investor. So let's just bring you up to speed what all this hoopla has been over the last 60 days and where this massive collapse in the energy space has occurred. This map you see on your screen in the pink and dark pink and the light shades represent oil and gas basins, meaning underground buried Grand Canyons full of organic material that it was trapped 50 to 150 million years ago. Now, it wasn't like we all of a sudden woke up as an industry 10 years ago and said, hey, wait a minute, we think we have these geological Grand Canyons that are buried. We knew they were there and we knew they had a lot of organic material. Organic material is what makes a barrel of oil and makes an MCF a gas. What we didn't know how to do was how to get the molecules of trapped oil and gas to become free enough to free flow to the surface to allow us to have commercial access to all of those oil and gas reserves. Now, why this is important is that within all those areas in pink, that's about 90% um, more mineral rights that were exposed to oil and gas commercial potential than existed even 10 years ago. In other words, if I showed you a map from 2009 or 10, it would have only about 10% of this pink on the page. So the, we now have tens of million millionaires that are being created as a result of owning minerals underneath these basins. That also means a whole lot of new investors or new sellers of minerals that would like to have the ability to sell their mineral rights. Well, guess what? You and I as private investors now can actually buy oil and gas mineral rights under big oil and gas wells, because now that market has become more uh, fungible and more accessible by private investors, specifically through your self-directed IRA. So let's use a visual. So here's the Grand Canyon. We all know that beautiful picture. The fact is you see the different shades of rock on the sides of the walls of the Grand Canyon. You see the river in the bottom. This is what these basins looked like before over time they were filled up to the top with other sedimentation and dead plants and animals over millions of years. Then all of a sudden, like a big boiling pot of rice, it was covered over. The magna inside the earth creates heat. The heat boils it like a pot of rice. The organic material turns into a com composition like dead animals. I mean, my favorite smell in the world is a, is a rotten egg because when you open up a tank of oil on a location, it smells like rotten eggs. It's dead plants and animals. I love that smell. 
But what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at the mineral market and how you as an investor might be able to say, how do I get my piece of the pie? That is something that has taken place in the last decade. So let's use you as an example of what's taken place and why we have this massive oversupply today. The top part of this chart shows you what a well looks like drilled in 2012. The well has been online for 87 months. It's generated about 2.3 billion cubic feet of gas, or in today's dollars, about $4.7 million worth of revenue. That's a very impressive well. Based on, on volume of gas, based on results, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very good well. It's not a great well, but it's a very good well. Oil companies have no problem drilling wells like this in order to generate that kind of revenue. The, the stimulation, the method in which we took to create the opportunity to develop these shell plays required artificial fracking, which allowed us to pump in water and sand and crack this hard, hard shale, which is what this basin is made of, and use it like a jackhammer. So we pump in fresh water and sand. If you'll notice on the top uh, well example, there's about 3.1 million pounds of sand that were slowly injected under high pressure to allow the rock to crack, and that allowed the molecules to free flow. Well, through advanced software and hardware, the oil and gas industry is the number one user of hardware and software computer technology. They advanced and improved that process, and you can see the bottom well, which was drilled in 2019, it generated as much gas and more revenue in five months as the well drilled almost seven years ago did in 87 months. So bingo, what happened is the oil and gas industry who knew geologically where all these basins are buried, they knew that it was virtually 100% chance of finding successful commercial and gas. They now did exactly what most manufacturing processes do. They perfected their system. And that gave us the ability to see two and three and four times as much production as we had even five or six or seven years ago. Now all of a sudden we have a, a COVID-19, we have a shutdown in demand for 60 days, and this tsunami and log jam of oil has now been created. It's a great thing for you and I as the American consumer. We now have all the cheap energy we want. Well, where's the opportunity in minerals? Well, let me go through that and tell you. So most of you probably have some type of real estate in your portfolio, whether it be your own personal building, whether it be some rental property, funds that you're in, as Clay mentioned. But like an income producing building stacked with layers of income, below the ground are, are a series of multiple formations loaded with oil and gas. And we want somebody to come in and lease our minerals, just like leasing your office building or your apartment. And they're going to pay all the costs and expenses, the electricity, the pump, or the insurance. And what we want is we want a revenue check every month for using our building or using our minerals. Because keep in mind, the mineral owner owns 100% of the oil and gas below the ground. So all I want to do is find somebody else who's going to take all the risk, spend all the money, oversee all the, of the operations and everything that goes involved in successfully operating the property and the minerals and send me a check without any headache every month. That's why I like minerals. So when we talk about real estate as a comparison, because they're both real property, the world's largest oil companies are your tenants. XTO, AOG, Derby, Lime Rock, Citizen, Exxon, they all come to me and they say, hey, Troy, you have minerals in the area we want to drill. We'd like to drill your, uh, we'd like to lease your minerals. And I say, great, what are the terms? We come up with a lease term for three years, just like an office building. The difference is they pay 100% of their lease money up front. There's no risk of somebody not paying me my rent. I get 100% of my lease terms up front, but more importantly than real estate, it's better than a triple net lease. I get a percentage of the profit. It's called a royalty distribution. So with any company that I lease with, I may end up with somewhere between a 15% and 25% ownership or royalty distribution from all gross proceeds. So let's just recap it. I own real property. It's just like real estate. I lease it to approved tenants. These are probably Fortune 500 companies that I'm leasing to. I have no concern or fear they're going to go bankrupt or won't pay me my royalty. I get all my lease money up front, unlike real estate that's paid out monthly. And I get to keep 15 to 20, 25% of all the revenue without any expenses, liability, exposure, environmental, zero liability. It is a net profit asset. Can't find anything better. So let's just show you a quick grid. I mentioned while I did, I'd show it to you. When you look at property taxes, repairs, utilities, variable tenant worthiness, how good your tenants are about paying their bills. I don't have all those concerns with mineral rights. Now, I love real estate. I've been a real estate investor my whole life, and I've made some very, very good money on real estate transactions. What I didn't like about real estate in 2009 
I didn't like all the banks knocking on my door and I didn't like the property taxes and the insurance. I didn't like the ongoing cost when all of my tenants decided to not pay their rent. With mineral rights, which I've owned now for 35 years, I simply get a check every day in the mail for minerals I own over seven states. It's a net profit. The biggest risk I have is a paper cut, opening the envelope, putting my name on the back of the check and putting it in the bank. Nowadays with ACH and digital, that even becomes less of a concern. So let's talk about how it works. The real money maker in minerals is well density. Now this is one thing I didn't mention, but I will now. The oil and gas concentration, how much oil and gas is in place, is the reason why the United States is the number one crude oil producer in the world, and we did that in less than 10 years. We went from running out of oil and gas in 2008, and many of you remember seeing uh, gasoline at the gas station at $4.50 to $7 a gallon, and crude oil price had risen to $145 a barrel. That was all because the U.S. energy companies could not find enough oil. We were down to 3.8 million barrels a day. We were running out. The price of oil skyrocketed to $145 a barrel. Well, today I'm firmly convinced that there were more profit in solving cancer than oncology. Cancer would be solved in a month, just like they're gonna solve this vaccine for COVID-19. When there's enough monetary incentive, things happen. Well, oil and gas figured out at $145 a barrel, we took the slogan, drill baby, drill to heart. We went out and we drilled wells in these shale basins and through very, very smart engineering and advanced technology, we figured out how to break open those shale formations and produce enormous quantities of oil and gas. So we went from 3.8 million barrels a day in 2008 and $145 a barrel. We now produce 13 million barrels a day the only problem is this little black swan called COVID-19 took away demand. Absent COVID-19, we'd probably be sitting at $42 a barrel. We never would have saw the negative price last week, and we still see most of our energy companies surviving and thriving and moving forward. Now we have an opportunity. So let's talk about what it looks like underground. So if you were a mineral owner, this basically is a schematic of approximately 2,500 mineral acres, you see the little uh, uh, schematic drawings or the little logos in the middle, which represent oil wells. These oil wells go down about a mile and a half to two miles below the surface. They then take the drill bit and turn sideways and they drill out one to two miles horizontally. When they do that, they capture the reserves, the oil and gas reserves for the mineral owners with that particular well or series of wells. The wells can go north two miles, south two miles, essentially, one very small footprint gives you access to almost four miles worth of oil and gas reserves as the example in the schematic shows you. Think about underground plumbing. If I had that tall building in the previous schematic next to this schematic, what you see is all the plumbing that went into the first floor, the eighth floor, and the tenth floor, it supplies the water, the utilities, and everything else. Well, all this is the same thing, but it's underground, just flipped upside down. So now here's where I like minerals and where I get excited as a potential mineral owner. I think about horsepower. You know, when I first got a car when I was younger and I didn't have any money, uh, I had a little small Dodge Colt and I tried to pass a semi truck on the highway and I got caught up in his wind draft and I couldn't get past him even as I geared the car down. I literally was stuck driving down the highway. I finally had to drop back behind the semi truck. I didn't have enough horsepower to pass this semi truck against South Texas wind. First thing I did was I took the car to the dealership and I traded for a big old Ford truck because I needed more horsepower. Well, minerals are the same way. So you and I, let's just say hypothetically, decide we want to be in the mineral business. We go out and we find an expert that can guide us in which minerals we should buy. And we find, okay, I like these particular minerals, A, B, C. They have one well producing on it at the time we purchase. So I have de-risk minerals. The well means I have cash flow and I've got one well. Well, how many wells will I have? I don't know, but I know I have a well, it's de-risk, and that one well is creating horsepower to generate income for me based on commodity price. So that's the equivalent to a pump jack. And by the way, for those of you who do not know, they call the head of a pump jack a horse's head. That's why I use horsepower as my analogy. So every time I see a pump jack, that's equivalent to one big Clydesdale horse pulling my financial wagon. Now we take a look at what really starts to get fun and where the real value in minerals occurs. Confirmation of mineral values means <clears throat> every time they drill a second well, it means to me, the oil company is confident there's a lot more oil and gas underneath these minerals. They spent eight to $12 million to drill a second well. Now you and I as mineral owners, we have two horses pulling our financial wagon. I like that, that's twice the amount of income, that's twice as fast as revenue. It also means I'm diversified in case there's a mechanical issue with one well. 
What it also means is that I probably have got twice as much oil and gas reserves that can be pulled out because this rock is like wetting down a concrete driveway. It may be as wet as you can see it on your concrete driveway. If you walked out and tried to get a drink of water from that wet concrete, your tongue would be raw. When they drill these wells and they put a horizontal well, a well bore through it and they frack it, it's like jackhammering your driveway. The oil and gas will pond or come closest to the point where the well bore is, just like the water will pond on the or cracks in the driveway. And so the second well means the oil is there, it's highly dense, it's proven, it's confirmed, the oil company is very economically satisfied. Now, this is what's happened in the last five years and why we have so much surplus oil and we're the number one producer in the world. Is now they said, well, if two works, how about three? Well, how about four wells on a single production unit? Now I've got four horses pulling my financial wagon. Okay, at this point, I'm making a lot of money on my royalties and I'm having very, very good success with my investment. But here's what's happened. Now they find out it takes eight wells. And now it's like having steroids on my cash flow. I now have eight wells producing revenue every month. I can be at the beach in Cayman Island. I can be in my house in Colorado. I can be traveling the world and every single day, 24 seven. I've got somebody managing wells, producing income for poor little me, Mr. Mineral Owner, who has zero liability and zero cost. This is what a real picture looks like. Okay, so this is in Oklahoma. You're driving down the highway and you see five acre, uh, what we call pad sites. It's fully set up almost like building a building. So each one of those drilling rigs is like putting in a four story building. Each well costs between 10 and $15 million per well, and they will drill somewhere between three and as many as 24 wells on each one of those pad sites, and they just walk their way down the road. This is not about expiration risk anymore, folks. This is about the United States has arrived as the number one producer because we have literally 30 states with oil and gas trapped in these basins. It's all about choosing. Do you want filet mignon or do you want lobster off that buffet you're about to partake in? It's your choice. Well, in this case, they're deciding do they want Oklahoma, do they want the Permian Basin in West Texas, or do they want to be in the Marcellus in Pennsylvania. Multi-well production sites offer substantial value for three reasons. When I own a mineral, let's say I pay $15,000 an acre for a mineral, right? I'm going to get a residual value in three different ways. I'm going to get residual value from the standpoint every well drilled is creating cash flow for me, so I get cash flow. When I sell my mineral interest, which we like to do about every four to five years, we'll sell our interest, interest into the market. The buyer is going to pay me based upon the other competitive values for minerals around me, which should be much higher as well as come online. They're going to look at my cash flow and they're going to determine, do you own a duplex, a fourplex, an eightplex, eightplex or multifamily apartment? What gives me the highest source of income with the most diversity? And then the last thing is, the sophisticated buyers who we like to sell to will actually determine how much oil and gas reserves are in the ground. Are we talking about 10 barrels, 10,000 barrels, or 10 million barrels? Well, I have news for you. The minerals that are currently being developed across the U.S., we're talking in terms of millions of barrels per well, at least in the standpoint of horizontal shale type of drilling. So this is an actual photograph of minerals that we own in Oklahoma. Um, it is a schematic showing you what it looks like from a drone picture. It has a schematic of the underground development in the bottom middle section of the slide in front of you. On the far left-hand side, the rectangle shows you how the pad site goes out to the north with four wells, to the south with eight wells. And so if you own minerals any long, anywhere along this four-mile rectangular path, you share proportionally in any value from those 14 wells that are being drilled, depending on how the operator set up the production unit. This is an EOG uh, pad site. So EOG, one of the biggest, most successful companies, very, very efficient in what they do. We have a massive multi-billion dollar company that at least drilled, paid all the bills, and every month they're gonna send us a royalty check for those 12 or 14 wells that have been drilled to date. Now, let's talk about the things that are most important to you as an investor. So if you're gonna use a self-directed IRA, you should know you'll make an investment today. About six months from now, you'll receive your first check for the royalties of the oil and gas sold in the month of March and April. The good news is those checks keep coming every single month for thereafter because you're paid first, you have zero property taxes and zero expenses. You're paid no matter what's going on in the economy, no matter what kind of pandemic, no matter what the oil companies are crying about not being able to pay their bills, the first check every month without any expenses taken out go to the royalty owners. We're, we're the top of the food chain. I'm gonna give this as an example. We have some of our minerals that we refer to at my company as golden nuggets. 
I think about the guys that were gold mining, you know, 100 years ago. You get your pan, you get in the river, you start panning for gold and getting little bitty flakes at a time. Well, because of the advancement of technology and the advancement of these shale basins, we now are seeing clumps or nuggets where you have 5, 10, 15 wells at a time on a single pad site. So in our case, we like the golden nugget type of product because it tells us that we have confirmation of a lot of reserves and more importantly is the oil company who's drilled the wells has already spent 75 to $250 million to drill those five to 20 wells. And what I now have is this cluster of value because I have multiple wells on a single mineral interest that I buy. The numbers you see on the page are an example of what we like to see, even at today's prices. We think if you buy into a golden nugget type of a mineral package, you could see returns as high as 33 to 66% return. You may be scratching your head and say, man, that sounds too good to be true. Well, if oil were $145 a barrel, and you had a better, healthier market for energy consumption, you would not see these types of returns because where I may be paying $13,000 to $15,000 an acre, I'd be paying more like $40,000 to $50,000 an acre. In some cases, you're paying $150,000 an acre. Today, we have an unusual opportunity to buy minerals at the bottom of the market, which significantly increases our rate of return and our expectation for performance. So why minerals and why a self-directed IRA? It's simple. Um, I'm 55. I don't plan on retiring for the next 10 or 15 years. I'm having too much fun. So what that means is I need to generate assets in a investment styled vehicle that allows me not to pay the taxes to avoid or defer the tax liability to let the assets I own in my self-directed IRA grow and create greater value. I want to be able to have cash. I want to be able to have value. I want to pay zero cost. I want to pay zero taxes until I withdraw my money. I want to find a really good custodian like Advanta IRA who professionally gives me that one-on-one -on -one concierge service with a, a manager to manage my account that knows me and knows what I'm doing. And more importantly is I want something that is going to be 100% in demand, which is what oil and gas is, because everything you're doing, the phone, the, the computer you're on, the chair, the carpet you're sitting on, 100% of what you're sitting in and using, including your clothes, came from or derived from a barrel of oil or were transplanted by a barrel of oil. That's the kind of asset I like to own. So how do you get involved in minerals? Well, first you decide that you want to be in that space. Do you want to have energy in your portfolio? Well, let me tell you something. When inflation kicks in or the stock market moves, one of the key factors to the growth in the stock market for the last 10 years has been the fact that we've had cheap energy prices. Well, if prices go up and we start to see inflation, I mean, I brought a, I bought a brisket two weeks ago here in Texas, cost me $54, that brisket should have been $20. We're gonna see inflation as a result of what's happened this COVID-19. So do you own energy that's gonna rise with inflation, that's gonna come back with demand, to offset what's gonna be lower rents, lower uh, occupancy rates of your real estate, and probably a very stressed out stock market. Step two, once you decide you wanna be in energy, is how much money do you wanna invest? Some people want to go in and put in twenty-five dollars or $50,000. Some people, like the gentleman yesterday, said, look, my bond portfolio is eroding. I'm getting calls on all my bonds, and they're going to put me back in at half the rate. I need to put several million dollars together to work for me by owning something like minerals that create cash flow. So the amount of money is best for you to talk to your advisor, your professional uh, registered investment advisor, CPA, and make the decision of what's appropriate for you. And then third and last is how do you get into the market? Do you find a company like mine? Do you buy into public companies that trade in mineral minerals themselves? There's four or five that I know of. I'm not impressed with them, but I know of them. Or do you find other companies like Eckerd Land and Acquisition that actually have private investors invest in mineral packages? That is totally your choice. Today is about telling you two things. If you're not looking at minerals, you should be. If you don't own minerals, maybe it's because you're either not qualified or you simply need more comfort to know it's a place you should be in. In our world, if you don't have a million dollar net worth and you don't have at least 25 to 50,000 of capital to invest, you don't qualify to be in minerals with our company. But as a, a matter of fact, you can buy minerals so easy, you can probably pull up to a truck stop in Oklahoma, look at the bulletin board, and there's probably two acres of minerals for sale. You can probably find it in magazines. Buying minerals is not hard. Like my dad said, you don't have to go looking for trouble, it'll find you. Well, minerals are easy to buy. The difference is, I don't want to own minerals. I want to own the right minerals, so I need the right expertise. That kind of wraps up my presentation. I turn it back over to Clay. Thank you very much for your time. We are looking at a very strong bullish market 
in oil prices over the next 24 months. From Eckerd's perspective, I think we're going to see oil over $75 a barrel within 18 months. I can explain that later, but today I just wanted you to know this is an asset that IRAs and self-directed IRAs may or may not consider to be an appropriate investment. Clay, it's back to you, sir. Great. Well, thank you, Troy. Yes, sir. That is really cool. So let me, uh, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is uh, put our contact information up here on the screen so that anybody who wants to write that down and get in touch with us can do that. And I will, I have the questions here on my console, so I think I'll just kind of read them out and we'll, we'll divvy them up as they, as they come out. How about that? Absolutely. <clears throat> so one is actually a question that I wanted to ask you when I, when I first saw the slides a while back. When so the, one of your first slides was the so I'm taking over the presentation I apologize no go, go for it the uh the there were so many deposits over so many states what kind of criteria do you did you use to narrow down where you wanted to be or what you thought was best that's a great question it's kind of like uh, hiring a fishing guide you say okay I'm going to hire you to go fishing on this lake how long have you been doing it what do you know is this your first day on the job and and how do you know where the fish are going to be. And so I, I like an oil and gas to be the same way. So I'm going to give you the simplest answer, although it's a lot deeper, more complex. But when I was a young man, Clay, I, I used to go out and, and uh, herd cattle out of these big mesquite ranches in South Texas. And so as a kid, I get out there and I looked at the guy, like you're asking me, and I said, how do we know where the cattle are so we can round them up in order to put them in the pen to do the things we've got to do? And he said, cowbirds. I said, what do you mean cowbirds? He goes, well, look at those white birds flying around in the air. They're hanging around the cows use the cowbirds to find the cows. It makes life a lot easier. I said, oh, great. Well, I'm gonna use drilling rigs and public records as my cowbird for oil and gas. For about 15 years, I've always had the mantra, follow the rigs. If you follow the active drilling rigs, whether it's a booming market or a down market like today, we're at the lowest activated drilling rig count we've had since 1941. That's how bad the industry is today. But wherever those remaining 380 drilling rigs are, the smartest engineers, the smartest geologists, the smartest petrophysicists, the smartest financial decisions, and probably the highest concentration of oil and gas reserves for the lowest recovery cost are in the 380 remaining rigs active today. So what we do is we look at the rig activity across the entire country, and that tells us where the smartest oil companies like Marathon and Exxon and Continental have decided this is the best place to spend our multiple billions of dollars, we then go and focus on those areas, and we have a lot more detail that goes behind it, but we look at the rigs as our guiding light or our, our lighthouse to tell us where we want to look. And then we use multiple different layers of parameters to decide who, what, where, when, and why once we follow the rigs. And that's really how we do it, is we look at where the activity is. It's been, it's been the best answer for the last, if you want to know who the smartest oil companies in the planet are, whether you're trading public stock or not right now, just look at who's got rigs active. It tells you two things. I still have credit. I still have money. I still have cash flow. And I'm only drilling the absolute best wells in $25 oil market. So that's who I'm looking at for public stocks, as well as where I'm going to buy my minerals. Interesting. Yes, sir. Okay. Let me uh, let me read some questions. So uh, this comes from a person who's been in the industry since 1977 in West Virginia. Sure. Uh, in an IRA, how do you cover future well plugging costs or other assessments against owners if in joint venture format after production decline turns into a negative cash flow at the entity level? Okay. Well, two things. Thank you very much for the question. By the way, we do have a lot of our investors are actually geologists, Exxon attorneys, engineers. So we attract a lot of industry experts who are our personal investors. So two things. As an industry expert, Keep in mind, you don't have any cost with minerals, zero. So I touched on that on two or three slides. So I don't care what the plug-in costs are because I don't pay them. I don't pay for reworks. I don't pay for liability. I have no environmental liability. As a mineral owner, that is not my problem. So I don't have to factor any cost, any future abandonment, and I really don't care about the decline curve other than decline curve tells me when I'm coming to the point of my economic payday, right? So the reason I moved to minerals is that personally, I've been involved in over a thousand wells I've drilled in probably eight different states for 35 years. Talking 10 and $15 million wells that were two miles in the ground, four miles in the ground, 20,000 feet deep. But the key to his question is, is that everybody that's viewing this should understand. When you're top of the food chain, the reason they call it a royalty distribution is just like the UK. The Queen of England owns a great deal of property and assets across the UK. 
Everybody sends her a royalty payment because she's the queen and she pays zero cost. Okay, they call it a royalty distribution because you are above the first line item every month above expenses, property taxes, any type of exposure, liability, environmental. So you don't have to worry about that. What you really worry about is when you pay for a mineral acre, you must determine if two things are going to happen. Is there going to be activity on that mineral which creates a way for the oil and gas to be extracted? So I'm only buying, I'm only buying ripened bananas. I don't buy green bananas. I need wells producing. I need operators operating. I need cash flow at the time I buy them. And the second thing is I need a historical pattern of what these wells would produce so I can compare what they produce to what I would expect and run a financial model that gives me very high assurance of what my financial returns are going to be. I'm not speculating. I'm not buying wildcats. I'm not buying green bananas. I'm, I'm buying cash flow. And, I, and I'll just chime in too on it. And this is a, a little bit off this particular asset, but there is a mechanism here from an IRA perspective that, that is good to know, which is that when your IRA owns an asset, if there's a capital call or a need for additional capital, it does need to come from the IRA. So that can be additional contributions or transferring from another account or liquidating another asset. But you do have the ability to adjust to the need, the potential need for additional capital. That's that is something that IRA uh, investors deal with regularly. Yeah, and I think, Clay, on that point, that's one of the reasons why when I made my own IRA investments, I was very, very concerned about buying anything in my IRA that might be uh, a reduction or a dilution of my value, such as capital calls, property tax, et cetera. So for my own personal IRA, I'm really, really picky about what I put in it because I don't want to lose any ground by having capital calls, cash calls, or expenses. So that's why minerals have been such a great investment for me is that it is a plus, it's a plus plus type of investment. It's always accretive. It's never diluted to my IRA portfolio. Hmm. And there's a follow-up question to the earlier one, which is, and I'll paraphrase it a little bit. So the over time, has there been a change in whether the royalty owners have to adjust to those kind of costs? Um, and this person is saying, uh, yeah, basically that that over time has the has the royalty owner always had no expenses or has that changed over time, I guess is the question. Well, let's put it to you this way. There, every state in the union has their own state guidelines and rules. So one of the questions earlier you asked, how do I decide out of all these basins in 30 states where I want to go buy minerals? I was born and raised in Texas. I'm about as Texas as you get. Uh, the fact of the matter is, though, I prefer Oklahoma to buy my minerals because the the rules and the regulations set up, set up in the state are what they call forced pooling. And forced pooling simply meant that when everybody got their horse and their flag and they ran out in the 1800s and stuck their flag in the ground to get their one section of land, they were given all the rights, surface, air, minerals. So the real issue was the state of Oklahoma did not want big companies overrunning small farmers or ranchers, so they come up with a, a policy called forced pooling, which means as long as you own one acre, in a two section, 1,280 acre drilling unit or production unit, you have the same right with one acre as the guy that owns 1,199 acres, right? So the, the effective rules in Oklahoma make it where I can compete with Exxon toe to toe, head to head, with very clear defined statutory rules in the state of Oklahoma. So I can't be run over, I can't be cut out, I can't be pushed out. I can get the same rights as a major oil company. Now that may not be true in Virginia, it may not be true in Kentucky, but those aren't big producing states. I mean, reality is you've got about four big kahuna states. It's going to be Colorado, Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, North Dakota, the core of the country. So those states are where I like to find the majority of the oil and gas because the reserves are so much bigger. But there's really only two or three states that have forest pooling. That's North Dakota, Wyoming, and in the state of Oklahoma. Doesn't mean I don't like Texas. It just means from a small investor's perspective, I need to know my minerals will be treated with the same respect as anybody else. So his answer to his question is, I don't know what Virginia does on their cost, but I know in Oklahoma, I don't even pay property tax. I get a net, net check. I never pay a dime. I have zero holding costs and I have zero liability. So I'm in Oklahoma. I'm not quite sure about Virginia. Okay. Next question is, are mineral rights costs tied to the oil price? 
Um, I'm going to say it's a great question, and it's not a direct correlation. Here's why. I have found there's two types of owners in minerals. There's the original owner of the minerals that have been heirs to the person who stuck the flag in the ground in the 1800s. So we're talking third, fourth generation, ranch owners, landowners who inherited the minerals along with the surface rights. Those surface rights were never severed and they paid the ranch off. Or they've owned a thousand acres or 500 acres for decades, right? That's what I call a original traditional mineral owner. A second type of mineral owner is somebody who's a flipper, like in real estate. They went out and they found somebody who needed cash to buy a tractor. Or maybe it's Nancy, the great granddaughter of Mr. Jones, who lives in Oregon, doesn't have a clue about minerals. They call her on the phone and say, you own 20 acres in Oklahoma. We'll pay you $5,000 an acre. Really? Yeah, you're going to get $100,000 if you agree to sell the minerals. Doesn't have a clue what she's doing. She sells the minerals. That person's buying them with the intent of flipping them, maybe after a well's drilled or two wells drilled or maybe double, triple, quadruple the price. There's always an, always an arbitrage, right? But in this case, the minerals themselves are traditionally owned by people who've been in the business for a very long time. So last year in the summer of 2019, that's when the oil and gas industry started to be uh, in a retraction mode. Most of you think it's been the last 60 days, but the truth is we were at 1,200 plus drilling rigs last April of 2019. We were down to 700 drilling rigs by December, which meant we already had a 45% reduction in drilling rigs. We knew we had too much production. The money guys in New York pulled out. Well, the mineral owners themselves started seeing less and less people knocking on the door to lease their property, less wells being drilled, so there was less demand. Prices started falling as early as April of last year. Now you have prices that are negative $37 a barrel, so you knock on the door of Nancy, who's actually living in Oklahoma. She knows the mineral market. You say, would you like to sell? She's like, I don't have to sell. I'm not going to sell. These are horrible prices. So I'll see you in a couple of years and I might consider it. But the flippers, they're in a different box. box OK, so we went from maybe 70 percent of our minerals coming from original owners and 30 percent from flippers because flippers ask too much for their property. I don't buy used product. Right. Because I know the juice is gone. Now the flippers are calling saying, oh, oh, can you please help buy some of my minerals? What minerals are they selling today? The very best minerals they have because there's no buyers in the market. In the middle of March this year, 30 days ago, my company, Eckerd Land, was the number one buyer in minerals in the state of Oklahoma. I'm a small family office. How in the world am I the largest mineral buyer that week in the state of Oklahoma? Because there's no buyers. All the flippers were loaded with way overpaid for minerals. They had nobody buying because they couldn't flip them. The market's in dismay, and only people with cash had the ability to buy those minerals. So to answer the far, final part of your question is that guy, that flipper comes to me and says, hey, I was looking for fifteen or twenty thousand dollars an acre last August. I said, great. Did you get it? Well, no, I didn't get it. Well, how much is it today? Would you give me ten thousand an acre? I go, well, let me run the price. So let's see. Today I'm at thirty. This afternoon I'm at negative twenty. This afternoon I'm at negative thirty seven dollars a barrel. I think we'll pay seven thousand dollars for your acreage and I can close in seven days with cash. So the market has a lot of flippers who owe seven, 10, 20 million dollars at the bank. They borrowed the money against their minerals, but they were using their royalty cash flow to make the payment. Their cash flow is down by 85%. They don't have the money to pay the bank. They're going to sell their prize bull to get through the winter. They're going to sell me their very best minerals today at rock bottom prices. So oil prices do affect minerals, but only to a certain degree. I don't think we're going to see mineral prices any, any lower. I had a client yesterday who said, Hey, come on, Troy, oil prices down. We might get minerals cheaper in August, September. I said, absolutely not. I said, it's as low as it's going to go. They just won't sell because they don't have to sell. But the flippers do. And I'm about as low as I can go. Hmm. Uh, next question. Is this only for accredited investors? Um, the answer is, in our company, we only take accredited investors. If you find other people who sponsor opportunities to get in minerals, because I don't do mine in partnerships, by the way. We take title, I buy all the minerals first, I take all the risk and buy the minerals. We then have purchase sale agreements in which investors who qualify, they join me, but their right of title is tied into a purchase sale agreement. If you're not accredited, my personal recommendation is you might be better off buying a publicly traded stock that's trading in minerals. One company I do like, and I think they're fairly priced right now is Brigham, Brigham Minerals on the Stock Exchange. A very, very smart guy that runs the company. I think they're pretty much debt free. They have a great expertise in minerals. 
Um, and so that's, I've looked at another couple that are selling minerals and I'm not too pleased with their management or their pricing. And I think they're out of their minds what they paid for minerals. So I wouldn't buy that as a stock, but as a non-accredited investor, uh, be very, very careful because the oil and gas industry is like any industry. It's probably 90% unscrupulous characters that are out there because you, the average investor, have no idea which way a drill bit turns, much less what's a good mineral. So it's really important you find people who are honest, have expertise, have a background that you can trust. I go with accredited investors because at this point in time, you're probably as a non-accredited investor, buying things like you know stocks, bonds, some real estate, building your net worth up so you're protected because you could always have another oversupply and your minerals go down in cash flow as a result of oversupply in the country. It's just whether you can withstand it. But that's my, my answer in general is non-accredited should probably build a stronger portfolio or maybe pick up some mineral stocks, but not direct ownership. Well, and I'll also say this is a this is a good IRA environment question as well. So whether it's this asset class or others, it often has to come. It often comes down to whoever is issuing their or offering the investment. So they they've organized themselves differently and offer different things. So as an investor, I think it's always a good idea to to look into the company. How are they organized? What are their goals and things like that? But from an IRS perspective, you don't have to be accredited, but there are other factors to be looked into. Absolutely, absolutely, Clay. Um, what is the minimum investment in mineral rights? Um, well, we had some minerals we looked at yesterday. They were $700 an acre. <laughs> so obviously that $700 an acre would be like me buying surface out in West Texas where one cow can't live on 100 acres, right? So we like the acreage, believe it or not, at $700 an acre, we think it has a lot of upside, but we might not have to wait three or four years. So when we talk about minimum investments, I think what's most important is to phrase it this way. A minimum investment is an investment increment that suits your portfolio. If you're worth $10 million, $100,000 is not a big deal. If you're worth a million dollars, $100,000 is 10% of your portfolio. In our company, we buy by the acre. 13,000, 6,000, 20,000. It depends on how many wells they have on it. Is it speculative? Is it low risk? There's a lot of variables. But in our company, we try to attract investors at about that $25,000 range because our goal is to build you what we hope would be a million dollar portfolio in minerals over the next five years. I can't really make um, a basket with one piece of straw. I, I think what happens is you have to have some reasonable balance. Um, you can buy minerals, though. I mean, some of our minerals have gone for as little as 6,750 an acre. Most people spend more of that on vacation than they do on mineral acre. So it is a really easy market to get into. Your self-directed IRA can be a really easy way to pick off one or two acres a month and just keep building value and let the cash come in. So it's not a massive investment. It's more what I call an accumulator. We have a strategy here called AML. We aggregate we maturate, we liquidate. This is after 35 years and all these wrinkles on my face. What I've learned is there's a time to get in, there's a time to sit back and let your crops grow, and there's a time to exit. We're aggregating fractional minerals that are spread all over the state of Oklahoma from people who are needing to sell for various reasons. We're gonna let those assets mature over the next 24 to 48 months as the oil prices rise and we see our wells come online and be turned online and produce. And then there's a time to liquidate. And what we want to do is we want to liquidate under our portfolio, probably at the end of 2023 or 2024, I think oil is going to be north of 75 to $80 a barrel. I want to take a third to half my portfolio, sell it, replenish my self-directed IRA. I now have half to two thirds of my minerals that I own free and clear that I bought this year. And I want to go do it again. This is a huge buffet of minerals. We've got 30 states. We're not going to run out of opportunity. But I also don't go to too many buffets where I see flies hanging around the filet mignon or the fish smells too bad. So we want to only go to five star buffets. We're not forced to buy every mineral that you would ever look at, at least from our company, I've already bought and paid for. So if no one buys it, I've already bought it. This is about you and what's best for your portfolio. So 25,000 is the minimum with our company, but you can get in minerals much cheaper, so $700. Go to that truck stop in Oklahoma, pull off that bulletin board, and I bet you can buy $100 minerals somewhere. You may never get drilled, but you can buy it. <laughs> and this is, a, this is another thing, too, with IRA custodians. So some actually do have some minimums for different things. Um, yeah. We don't, so, and the IRS doesn't either, right? So, again, you know, knowing who the players are and what their particular rules are is, is a, an important thing for your strategy. Yeah, I agree. Um, 
Can you 1031 exchange rental real estate into mineral rights? Yes, sir, you can. In fact, it's it's uh, very much been sought after the last six months. At uh, In December, we were quite surprised how many uh, individuals contacted us to do 1031 exchanges into minerals. And so one thing I will tell you is oil and gas guys will sell minerals like we might in three years, and they roll into real estate, which I think is going to be in a low market in three years. So what I've seen from a lot of my wealthy investors over the last 35 years, they're pretty smart, that's why they're rich, is that they'll take real estate right into its high, they'll sell out, they'll 1031 into oil, which is usually low, because real estate goes up because you have cheap labor, cheap fuel, cheap materials. They're almost polar opposite of one another. So now everybody's rolling out of real estate doing 1031s into minerals, and then when they're turning around, they'll roll back three years from now out of oil and gas when it's stopped back into real estate, which they think is gonna be a low. Uh, we've been really fortunate to see that 1031 exchange work very, very successfully. The key component to, to 1031 is forward planning. Let us know what you're looking at, the dollar amount. We can then create a portfolio for you of the type of risk and the, and the portfolio mix of minerals that you may want to achieve your financial goal. And then we can help put the timing in place. If you've got a 1031, you think it's going to happen at the end of June, we can give you that portfolio. You can do your due diligence and decide this is what I want to do. Um, we, we were shocked by the number of 1031 clay that came in the last part of last year. And I'm assuming until everybody figures out where the real estate market is and we get all this activity back again, we imagine the last half of this year is going to be really, really busy with 1031 exchanges, in my opinion. Uh, next question. <clears throat> where do you see the price of oil going? <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I'm a very bold, I'm a very bold individual and I can send you on my, uh, I'm a massive data provider. I am a research maniac. I don't sleep much. You can tell by the bags of my eyes, but um, I'm going to tell you boldly where I think we're going. I said this back in March. I said Saudi Arabia and Russia won't last more than 60 days on this bluff. I said after the coronavirus started, I said well, you're going to see the largest reduction in supply you've ever seen because, quite frankly, there's no way in the world you're going to have any type of uh, assembly line replacement of barrels of oil that we're using today. So my whole premise that I've had for three months has been the following. I think we're going to see oil be between $35 and $45 a barrel by December. I'm now thinking it's going to be closer to $45 a barrel. I believe that oil prices in 2021, second half of the year, we're going to be pushing close to $55 to $60 a barrel. The good part, the fun part is, I believe by the second quarter of 2022, we're north of $75 a barrel. And there's one real reason. You've got these inverse relationships happening between oversupply temporarily and production shutdown or curtailment. So it's not just them choking off the well. It's not them just shutting the valves in to lower the production. It's not just Saudi and, and OPEC deciding to cut back into production. 100% of the global oil and gas projects like pipelines, refineries, drilling, platforms, offshore, onshore have been canceled. The money has disappeared. So when you look at a declining asset like oil production, every day there's less oil in that reservoir than there was the day before. Well, all the shut-ins are fine. That's just a temporary fix until demand catches up. We've got about 1.4 billion barrels of oil in excess supply around the globe. Oh my God, that sounds like a lot of oil. That's 21 days worth of production, 21 days. We consume 100, billion, 100 million barrels a day in a normal environment. Even if we take just a, a modified demand increase, we will can take up and, and consume that oversupply by probably the first quarter of next year. So now we're back to par, consumption delivery. The only problem is we shut our plant down. We shut down all of our drilling. We shut down all of our production. So now all of a sudden demand's gonna keep going back as we all like you know, going to the movies, eating our food, driving our cars. Demand will crawl back over 24 months. Instead of having 100 million barrels a day worth of, of production, we're gonna have about 85 million barrels a day or less. We're gonna be short by 15 to 20%. So that pendulum swung way too far to negative $37 on the trading platform. When it swings back the other way, we could easily be over $100 a barrel. There's a Goldman Sachs article out yesterday that says exactly that. We're about to run into a massive bull oil market in the next 18 months. It's exactly what I've been saying for two months. It is a double-edged sword. It is supply elimination and future supply and increasing demand. We're at the perfect apex at the bottom. Buying minerals now is the best thing you can do because it's only up from here. When I'm in the gutter, there's only one way to look up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go with this. So there's, there's a few more questions. But I'm gonna just ask two more. Uh, one's, sure. a, one's a broad one and then a, a little bit of a, a speculative one. So uh, what is the risk? 
the rest are, well, the rest are easy. Uh, the guy you invest with is a crook. He doesn't really own the minerals. He lies to you, takes your money, and he's on Jamaica drinking Mai Tais by five o'clock on Friday. That's, you know, the problem is there's, there's so many crooks out there these days. I'm scared to answer any email I get. I'm afraid somebody hacking into my system. Um, the real risk in minerals is as follows. And, and I have bought minerals that this has happened to me before 10 or 15 years ago. I bought some minerals in Montana. I was surrounded by three major billion dollar oil companies. We had leases, they had rigs running. And the 2014 crash meant that they had to change their economic strategy. So those companies decided we got to choose filet mignon, or, or, mignon or, or lobster. They pulled back in and they decided to not drill those wells at that time. Well, guess what? There hasn't been a well drilled in the state of Montana since 2014. So I own really good minerals with a lot of reserves in it. But until somebody puts a drill bit in the ground, I have no way of getting my oil out of the ground. So I got this nice big chunk of minerals in Montana that until the prices are right and somebody drills it, they're really going nowhere. It's like owning that parcel of land that nobody's ever going to build or put a house on. You own it. You can go look at the trees. creates no value. The good news is there's zero holding costs. I don't have to pay anything. So what you do is you accumulate your expertise and knowledge. And how do I avoid that from a risk standpoint is I only want to buy minerals today that already have a well drilled, a well producing, five wells drilled, four wells that are online, four wells have been drilled, just not completed. In other words, I am looking for completely de-risked minerals in my opinion. And I also want to know that the company that owns or leased those minerals from me or from the mineral owners is somebody the size of Exxon or Chevron or Continental Resources or Marathon. I want to make sure it's people who can stick to the game. So we've we've learned over the last 35 years. I'm a lot smarter today than I was when I was a kid at 20 years old when I got into business. Today, there is so much on the buffet menu. I don't have to have a hanger steak. I don't have to have fajitas. I can get filet mignon. I can buy minerals under Exxon's wells. The package we just sold out this last week, Clay, was Exxon Wells. We bought minerals that were under five sections of land and 19 wells drilled, six three-year-old wells. They've been online for three years, so what I call vintage production. Six brand new wells that were about $12 million a piece. So that's close to $150 million spent. Seven wells that were drilled that have just yet to be completed. So I got 19 wells, four permits. Our price per acre, $10,500 per acre. I would have paid $30,000 an acre last summer for that. This guy called, had a bank note, had to have the minerals released from the bank. And I said, like the IRS, I'm here to help you. <laughs> <laughs> so our partners jumped on that. And I think we had 94 acres. I want to say we had maybe 15 acres left as of yesterday morning. So, because how in the world can you buy minerals paying $550 for a producing well? It'll never happen in my lifetime again. So, yeah, I'm, I'm cashing out my kids' college funds. I sold my wife's jewelry last week. Everything I have, I'm throwing in the minerals because I, as an old guy, I know how good the value is right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to – so there are a couple more questions, but I'm, and, and a couple of these are duplicates, so I'm just going to amalgamate them a little bit. And the, the gist of it is really this. So for those of you who are asking very specific questions about returns, I'm going to encourage you to just, just call Troy, um, you know, Call Eckerd Land and Acquisition, and they'll give you whatever detail you want. They're they're happy to do that. I'm Absolutely. paraphrasing for Troy, but I'm I'm pretty sure that's true. Um, but but there is a question about you know what what is a sample return? Let's say somebody invested a hundred thousand dollars in mineral rights in a in a similar model that Eckerd uses, mm -hmm. and what what's the range of returns that they might expect? So so I'm going to tell you what I. When I spend my money, because I buy all the minerals myself, here's exactly the financial parameters that I buy. I want to go buy minerals that in the first 12 months will make me at least 6% return, but I'm really targeting 10 to 15% return first 12 months, okay? That tells me I probably bought a mineral with one well or two wells online. I can look at its production. I can calculate what it's doing, and I know I'm pretty comfortable. I'm going to get a minimum of 6%, but I'm really looking for 10 to 15%. But the minerals I'm buying and the financial performer that I'm working off is I am fully confident that we're going to see multiple additional wells drilled or turned online in years two, three, and four. So you're going to have this, this little financial curve that says, okay, I'm targeting the first 12 months between 6 and 15%. Commodity price is going to be the biggest driver that makes that whether it's 6 or 15, okay? Now it's 6% because we're at $25 oil. It should be 10 to 15% under normal circumstances. So 
Today, the first 12 months, I expect six to 15%. When they turn those wells they've drilled online that they've already drilled, but they haven't fracked yet, I expect a huge bump in my revenue by spring or fall of next year. Now my income can be 18 to 30% rate of return. Over a five year period, I want nothing less than double digits. Over five years, I expect to have six to 15, 18 to 25 or 30, 18 to 25 or 30. Maybe I see a decline because my wells have come off that flush production. But when I get ready to sell my minerals in 48 months, I would have expected to return double digit returns. I'm thinking mid teens. And by the time I sell, I'm looking for over 30% return. I've got millions of dollars of my money invested in these minerals. I have a lot of choices I can do in my life with what I want to do with my money. The market has presented itself a unusual perfect storm. And as an investor today, I can buy in and know that I'm going to get very low, 6 to 15% at the worst part of the market. But man, I've got nothing but upside riding based on wells drilled and commodity prices. So I'm very comfortable that what we can show, in, in our opinion, remember, like real estate, when you go out and look at a raw piece of land, somebody says, well, what can you get for it? Well, I know one day there's going to be an apartment complex here, so I think it's worth $30 a square foot. No, no, no. What do you want today? Well, today I want $5,000 an acre. Okay, great. What can I make of that? Nothing. Well, minerals are the same way. Your rate of return is based on the value proposition. The more developed, the more entitled, the more you'll pay, the lower risk you have, the faster to receiving that rate of return and a greater probability that you'll be successful in your venture. So we're actually paying a little more per acre now because we want those projects like the one I described that has 19 wells on. I paid that guy 20,000 an acre. He's a knucklehead. He, he sold way too cheap, but I'm not going to encourage him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think, again, if your question has not been answered, we will certainly answer them via email. I'm happy to do that, and uh, but I do think it's time for us to kind of go about the rest of our day. Hey, Troy, really appreciate you sharing your expertise thank with you us. Yeah, it was, so, uh, Clay, thank you so much. I really appreciate all your time. Thank you very much. It was a really interesting view into an asset class that I didn't know a lot about, so thanks a lot. Yes, sir. And, thank you. Yeah, and thanks, to everybody, for joining us. Uh, yes, there is a, a recording of this, and you'll get an email, so if you want to review the recording, you absolutely can do that, and do uh, feel free to reach out to uh, – myself or to Eckerd, Eckerd Land and Acquisitions about any specific questions that you have. And I hope the rest of your day is a good one and a safe one. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Clay. See you. Bye.